um, I'm going to do my talk, and I would really like if this could become interactive and you could uh, um, ask questions. So uh, Redbeard actually has a mic there somewhere, and if anybody has a question, just show up. I'm, I'm not sure if I will see you because I got all the light here in my face, but uh, yeah, I hope somebody will notice. So yeah, don't uh, hesitate and ask questions. Completely interrupt me. I like that. Um, I'm going to do a fairly tactical talk today, so um, I figure. Most of the times, keynotes are probably not the most technical, but mine will definitely be very technical. I'm. Uh, <laughs> okay, I did not expect that, but I appreciate it. Um, okay, um, I'm not going to talk about containers, right? Like uh, at this conference, I think uh, pretty much every talk mentioned containers in one way or another. And uh, containers, in a way, are a security feature. But uh, I'm just going to touch it very briefly. I'm actually going to, touch, uh, to talk mostly about uh, system services and security applied to normal system services. After all, systemd is primarily um, a system and service manager. So um, yeah, let's jump right in. Um, the message that I really would like to get across is um, sandbox everything, right? And by sandboxing, um, I mean not just uh, in containers, but actually in normal system services too. Like normal system services are basically everything that we ship in systemd, like the journal or hostnamed d or machine d or whatever else, but also everything else that is shipped directly on the system and not shipped as a container. Um, of course, to, to give a little bit of background, what, what's a system service and what's a container? You know, container, I, I'm pretty sure most people actually know that answer, but yeah, traditionally on Unix, everything was sh shipped as a system service, right? Like as a sys5 service. Um, where you had the shell script that was starting some binary, um, and uh, it would be integrated into the rest of the system, right? It would show up in the process tree of the host as a normal uh, um, a process, and um, th when it's running, it actually can see the rest of the system too. It would see the same directory hierarchy, it would see the same process tree, it would see the same users, it would see the same everything, right? Um, containers, on the other hand, try to isolate that out. Um, of course, um, systemd and spawn, uh, which is the core of like, the, the actual execution engine behind Rocket, but it's also a pretty useful tool on its own. Um, it is about security, security to a certain level. Um, but again, I'm mostly not talking about that, um, except for one little thing that I would like to mention. Very recently, we added to nSpawn this uh, functionality of user namespaces. User namespaces, um, not sure how many of you heard of that at this point in time. The user namespace is a new kernel feature. It's supposed to fix a couple of issues um, and um, a variety of areas in our stack. First of all, um, it's going to uh, fix some security issues with uh, containers, but it's also going to fix, uh, um, like, help doing desktop applications on the other end of the spectrum. And it also helps us doing something with in system the end spawn that we can actually isolate the system from the container a little bit better. User namespaces are, I would call them, work in pros, uh, progress mostly, um, both on the kernel side and on the user space side. But very recently, we added to Nspawn the automa automatic uh, uh, logic that I think make user namespaces um, work automatically for the first time uh, for most users. And I'm pretty sure it will eventually also show up in Rocket that way. Um, until that point, user namespaces, I think, uh, were mostly something that people wanted to have on their checklists and to say that they supported. But I don't think they were really uh, deployable. But uh, yeah, with the next version of systemd that's coming up in a few days, uh, we'll, for the first time, actually support user namespaces and systemd and spawn directly. And that's pretty much everything I will talk about containers today. So. Um, let's go to the first security feature. Uh, one security feature that I would like to talk about is uh, the service file option, private TMP equals yes. My assumption here, by the way, is that everybody here has seen at least uh, one of the service files um, that systemd maintains. Um, for those who have not seen them, a very short recap is that in, in systemd, every service gets its little description file, which we call the a unit file, and it looks like a Windows ini file and it has a couple of settings. In the best case, it only has like two lines, uh, basically one that says what binary to call and one section, and that's kind of it. Um, I don't really want to go into detail with that because I don't want this to be an introduction to systemd, but under the assumption that most of you have seen one of those files, I would like to um, just talk a little bit of the various interesting security features that you can actually uh, make use of if you write those files. 
the first one being private TMP. Private TMP is something, if you, it's a Boolean. If you turn it on, then your service, whatever that may be, um, will get its private instance of slash TMP and slash var TMP. Private instance, uh, meaning that, uh, yeah, whatever it writes to slash temp or slash var temp, uh, no other service on the system will see. Um, this is actually a big improvement, because uh, if you look at, over the history of Linux, um, then uh, um, over all those years, it was in regular intervals. It happened that um, popular server software, and actually any kind of so, uh, software, had problems um, writing temporary files, because they made the names guessable, um, and hence, uh, um, uh, uh, like, rogue users on the system could um, DOS um, server software this way. With private TMP, that's kind of think of the past, because every service can get its own instance of slash temp. What's also nice is that the life cycle of that is bound to the service runtime, meaning that if you start the service, um, this private directory, uh, this, this private version of um, slash var and var uh, TMP is created, and when the service shut down, it's automatically removed. So the life cycle of the temporary files is for the first time actually bound to the service that, that actually um, writes them. Which is, I like to believe, a big improvement because uh, traditionally slash temp doesn't really have any sane life cycle um, at all. And um, yeah, usually the files just stay around forever until they're cleaned up. That's a question. Is there a way, there a way to, get to get access to those if I'm trying to debug a service, for example? Um, yeah, there's a way how you can access, uh, get access to those. What this actually really just does is it opens a file system namespace and uh, then makes a subdirectory of slash temp viable as slash temp, right? And this subdirectory is named um, slash temp slash uh, uh, systemd dash the service name and some random suffix to make it non-guessable. So as an administrator, if you actually want to would like into the, look into that uh, private instance, you can totally do that. Just do ls and slash temp. And it should be pretty obvious to you. Um, yeah, it's kind of cool, actually. And, uh, um, especially the thing that it, the life cycle is bound to the service makes it make slash temp and temp file and all those APIs much nicer to use because you don't have to think about um, uh, filling it up forever. Now. Um, Related to this, there's actually a, a kind of dependency, right? In, in systemd, all those unit files, they have dependencies each other, and they basically declare that this service requires that service or shall be started after that service. There's one type of dependency which is called joints namespace off. With that stuff, you can actually run two services in the same namespace. What namespace precisely means here, it's one thing. We just talked about private TMP. It basically means that if two services where one declares joins namespace off to the other, we'll get the same slash TMP. That is actually pretty useful, because uh, traditionally in, on Unix, um, a lot of communication sockets, including MySQL, for example, did that, um, and X famously, um, uh, put their communication sockets in slash temp. So if, them, if you give them all a private uh, instance of that, um, nobody else could talk to them anymore. That's kind of a way out there. Um, this setting is not only about a private TP, it's, it's about a, a couple of other things. One of them is private network 2, which we'll talk about very shortly. Next feature, which is capability bounding set. Capability bounding set is actually something, it makes use of Linux capabilities. I'm not sure if many of you heard about Linux capabilities, but it's a, it's a kernel feature that has been around for quite some time. It's uh, moderately useful. Um, it's not super useful, unfortunately, but it's moderately useful. And it, is a, a, it is not something that will provide you with um, a lot of security, but it can be a, a piece of the puzzle to provide good security for, for um, uh, services. So capabilities are something that the Linux um, kernel defined, and that basically tries to split up the privileges that the root user gets on Linux into a couple of separate bits. I think there have been like 34 or something bits defined at this moment, where one bit, for example, is um, access to the system clock. Another one is um, network configuration changes. Um, there's one to enable accounting, to enable auditing, and these kind of things. And if you run a service with a reduced set of these capabilities, then it basically means um, that all, every capability that the service does not have, it cannot um, do anything with. This is pretty useful. For example, if you have something like a, NTP client, right, like that generally runs on pretty much any operating system. Um, you don't have to run it as root anymore. All you do have to do is you run it as any user and give it that one extra capability of being able to set the clock, and you have a more secure system because it cannot do mounts and unmounts and all the other kind of privileged stuff. The only privileged stuff it can do is set the clock. So capability bounding set is how we primarily expose it to systemd. Um, 
If you want to know how to actually use that, I recommend actually looking at the man page because it's probably a little bit too specific here. But basically, you just list those well defined names, the capabilities there, and then that's what the uh, service gets and nothing else. There's something very related, which is ambient capabilities. The capability bounding set basically says that the service may, whatever it does, never get more capabilities than this. The ambient capabilities um, setting, on the other hand, says run this as a normal user, but in addition to what a normal user can do, give it these capabilities. So one is additive from, from nothing, and one is subtractive from everything, if you follow what I mean. Um, here's an example that I kind of already talked about. If you said capability bounding set caps as time, that basically says run the service, but give it no chance to do anything else privileged than setting the time. Let's go to the next topic, uh, the next setting, which is private devices. It's actually a really useful one. Private devices basically says, run this service, but give it a private instance of slash dev. Right? Slash dev, as we all know, is where the device nodes are, is where the raw uh, access to, to, to hard disks, to, to uh, all kinds of devices that you have connected, all kinds of desktop devices, all kinds of server devices, whatever it is. Right? By setting private devices equals yes, your application runs with a private version of slash dev that only includes these pseudo devices like slash dev null, slash dev zero, slash dev full, slash dev random. But that's pretty much it. Right? There are a couple of three more. But these aren't really devices. They, are, they, they don't really correspond with physical devices. They're just the way how Unix decided to do its API. Um, it's really powerful, because there are a lot of um, services on the system, starting from your database or your, your um, web server, that generally don't need raw hardware access. With this one setting, it's really easy. Just set that, and there it's gone. It cannot access any, that anymore. Uh, let's go to the next one, Protect Home. I figure, um, yeah, this is, this is also pretty useful. It kind of does what the name suggests. It protects slash home from the service. Because most services that are run on the system, they should never be, uh, have, to access, uh, have to have access to the user's home directories, right? Everything in slash home, everything in slash root. By setting Protect Home equals yes, it means the service runs. It sees the full directory tree with two exceptions. Slash ho home is gone and slash root is gone, which is pretty nice, because if you log into your server and you put in your SSH keys and put, put in whatever else you have there in your, sh in your history, by setting that for a service, you can be sure that if your Apache is exploited, um, they cannot get access to your private administrator data or user data. Um, there's also a weaker version of this, which is protect home equals read only. In this case, you still get access there, but only read only access, and they cannot modify anything. It's really, really simple. You just set that, and um, there you go. You already have a lot more security. Um, there's another one, protect system, yes, no, and full. Um, protect system, yes, no, and full. That basically says, um, I mean, uh, on, uh, on CoreOS, it's kind of redundant to have this, but on pretty much any other Linux, it's still necessary. It basically says, run the service, but make slash user read only. Because that's really how services should be run. They should not be able to modify um, uh, uh, slash user. So by setting protect system equals yes, that's what you get. You can also set protect system equals full, and in this case, also slash Etsy is read only. Right? So um, I recommend generally um, that all services should be run like that. And if they don't need to make configuration changes, which most services uh, should, really shouldn't do, then set it to protect system and f uh, to equals full. Um, here's another one. Mount flex equals slave, right? So if your service got exploited, then it can do, and then it runs as a root, then it can do pretty much anything it wants. With mount flex, you can restrict one uh, facet of it, which is uh, mount propagation. That basically means that uh, um, a container, a, a service that has this set, will not be able to make any changes to the mounting table so that um, uh, it would propagate to the rest of the system. Meaning, basically, let's say you have Apache again, and if you said mount flex equals slave, um, and somebody explo exploits your Apache, it can mount as much as it wants, and it can try to overmount Etsy and slash run and slash user and um, bin ls or whatever else, but these mounts will never appear in the host, right? They are specific to the Apache instance then. It's actually a really easy way to, to, to lock down your services. Um, I already talked, by the way, again, if anybody has questions, totally interrupt me. Um, nobody here? Um, 
So I talked a lot about these things like private devices and private uh, and protect home, protect system, and things like that. And they mostly what they do is they they create a file system namespace, right? Like like a container would do too. Um, but instead of, of of being like a container where the container sees a completely different uh, a view of the file system tree, the, the settings that I just discussed basically take the file system tree of the host and make minor modifications to it. Um, now, with read-write directories, read-only directories and inaccessible directories, you get a powerful tool to do this much more explicitly and much more uh, in, a, in a more complex way yourself without relying on these high-level switches that I just talked about. Right? So again, uh, these protect system, for example, just did Etsy and user and some special stuff with that. With these things, you can do the same, the same thing, like make things uh, unavailable to, to the ser service and make it, or make it read-only for a service and do it for any um, kind of directory you want. Um, here's another one, SLinux context. I'm not sure, like, given that this is a Quora's conference, I don't think that SLinux is shipped in Quora OS. Um, but uh, yeah, we have integration for these three um, Macs. Um, like one is the Intel one, which is Mac. Um, then we have the Ubuntu one, which is AppArmor. And then there's the Red Hat one and NSA one, which is SLinux. And uh, you can explicitly select um, your SLNX contacts, your app on a profile, or your Smack process level for each service you run explicitly um, for those people who want to do that. Another security feature is uh, no new privileges. It's actually it's based on, the, on, a, on a recent kernel edition. Uh, it basically says, if you, it's, a, it's a Boolean. It's really easy to use again. It basically says that anything that is spawned or, or started within this process may not acquire new privileges, as the name suggests, meaning it uh, well, is not allowed to do any further UID or GID changes anymore. It's, it's stuck in the UID or GID that you give the service. And it cannot acquire any uh, new capabilities. So basically, the, the, the effect of that is that the you know, set UID binaries and set GID binaries use their power. And so do binaries that have file system capabilities set, if you know what those are. Um, next one, system call filter. This is actually. Also one of those more moderately useful ones, but I think it's actually a nice um, uh, 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 tool you can build something really powerful from. System call filter allows you to put filters on system calls for specific services, right? So system calls, as you know, like are, are how user space communicates with the kernel, right? There's a system call called open to open a file and one called rename to rename a file and so on and so on. But there are also quite a few system calls, like one uh, system call to reboot or another system call to to uh, set the system time or another system call to mount. Um, and those are the primary interfaces to do these certain things. By using system call filter, you can apply a filter so that the um, uh, applications cannot do that anymore. It basically just takes a list of these, these um, system call names, um, and it does the right thing, and we'll just apply them. Um, here's an example. You can write system call filter fork v fork clone. And if you do that, it basically means these three um, uh, system calls are not allowed for that service anymore. As most of you probably know, those three system calls are, are how um, one process can fork and become a second process too. So by setting this, you basically prohibit forking, which basically means you, your service will only consist ever of, of, one service, uh, of one process and not more. Here's another one, system call architectures. Um, it's probably not the most interesting one, but I, I'll mention it anyway. So uh, over the, the, the um, history of Linux, right, the kernel had a lot of exploits. One was multiple times in the layer that made sure that you, if you have a 32-bit binary, you can run it on a 64-bit host, right? Because all the system calls need a certain level of translation there, because the user space uses the different um, uh, word width than the, than the kernel space. Now, <coughs> with system call architectures, you basically can filter that out. You can basically say that, uh, yeah, my user space, like this user space that I'm, um, this service that I'm running here may not do 32-bit syscalls anymore because I know that my user space is 32-bit and uh, it's a 64-bit and my kernel is 64-bit and it shouldn't allow anything else. So... Oh, just, just a quick question. You kind of skipped over the private network flag. Was that on purpose or...? Oh, did I skip that? Sorry. That was not on purpose. Oh, yeah, oh. sorry. Yeah, it looked too different, so I didn't notice that they were actually switched over there. Sorry. OK, let's take a step back and uh, talk a bit about private network. That's actually a pretty useful one, too. It basically allows you to run a service um, and disconnect it from the network. 
right? Because many, many services don't need network access. Um, many do, but uh, a lot don't, right? Like by simply setting that, uh, the service, when it's running, will get access to the loopback device, right? To 127001. But it will get no access to anything else. It will not even see any other network interface. And it's a great way to build a sandbox um, because you know that uh, nobody can exploit it because there's no way into it from remote. Um, thank you for the pointer. So let's jump forward again. Uh, yeah, system call architecture. So um, yeah, most of you probably don't even care about 32-bit um, architectures anymore, but your kernels still come with compatibility um, uh, uh, for the old stuff so that you can run 32 and 64 on the same system. But um, because nobody actually really runs it that way anymore, um, it's, uh, again, as mentioned, had a lot of security problems, and it probably still has. With system call architectures, you can turn this off. This is one example. You basically can say, on my system, only the system call architectures x86 and x86-64 are still allowed. Um, more useful is this one, which basically says, on my system, only the native way to invoke um, uh, system calls is still allowed. Honestly, it's probably what you should be setting um, on all your systems always. Uh, there's actually a global setting for this one as well, so you can do that system-wide. Um, and basically means, yeah, uh, invoking 32-bit binaries on your system is not allowed anymore. Um, here's another one. It's actually one that uh, uh, we kind of stole the idea from Android because they, they have this kind of sandboxing too. It kind of does uh, what the name suggests. It restricts the supported or the accessible address families, the sockets of the uh, address families um, of the service. Specifically, um, here's an example. By setting restrict address families A of Unix, you basically say, this service may create any socket it likes as long as it, as, it is, as it is an A of Unix, like a local IPC socket. Here's another example. Oh, my LaTeX actually ate the, the tilde. So there's a tilde here. Um, what's my LiDAR pointer there? See, so you think of the tilde there, so it's actually for inverting it. It basically says, like, the second line with the tilde in there is supposed to say, this socket um, may do only um, it may, may do any kind of socket except for the internet uh, sockets, like IPv4 and IPv6. Which, of course, means, uh, yeah, it can still do Netlink, Unix, um, all kind of weird stuff like uh, infrared and things like that, but at least it can't get on the internet anymore. Um, any further questions at this time? You should more ask more questions. Don't hesitate to ask questions. I will ask you one then, Leonard. So how a lot of folks here are probably used to running systemctl uh, uh, daemon reload to reread all of the configs. But at the same time, you mentioned setting global systemd variables. How would one actually trigger the reload of reading all those variables? Um, that's a very good question, actually. So most of these variables can only be set when a service is started. Right? They, it only then has an effect. It's simply because it, that's how Linux works. Well, you set a couple of settings, and then you fork off the daemon, and then the daemon actually inherits that into all its processes. So um, uh, if you, if you want to do the local settings, what you do, you just edit the unit file. You can do that with system control, edit, uh, the, uh, then edit, uh, and then the unit file. Um, then you make a change. Um, then system control, edit will automatically do the equivalent thing to system control daemon reload. And then what you at last step have to do is actually do system control restart of that service so that the binary is forked off again and has these settings applied. If you do the global thing, you kind of have to do the same thing, right? You set the global thing by editing at systemd system.conf, make your change there, do a system control daemon reload so that um, systemd um, knows about it, and then you actually have to restart the individual daemons so that this new setting, setting is actually propagated into it. Right. Sometimes, though, you also have to reload PID1, though, too, and there's a command to do that. Yeah, that's always system control daemon reload. System control daemon reload will actually reload systemd's own configuration plus all the unit files. Okay, but again, it will not have any effect right away. It will just mean that every service that is um, started from that point on will get that as default. Um, any further questions at this point? Um, I don't see anybody showing up. So. The next one I would like to talk about is user and uh, group and supplementary groups. It's kind of, uh, it's probably an obvious one, right? Like, uh, what it that allows you is run any kind of service you like 
under the user ID or group ID or supplementary group ID that you specify here. It's actually a very efficient way how to write Unix services because it relieves the developer from actually writing the privilege um, dropping code um, that you normally have to write. So uh, um, if I want to write a secure service that does internet or whatever, um, then I write my little service and I just start doing whatever I want to do. And with this, I can make sure that it doesn't run as root, but runs as any other user um, you like. Um, there's one neat trick. You can actually combine this with limit and proc. Limit and proc sets a resource, resource limit. I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you probably heard of resource limits. There are these classic Unix ways how you can put limits on resources. Resources being something like memory and file descriptors and a couple of things. One of them is particularly interesting, which is limit and proc. Limit and proc um, sets the number of processes that a specific user can have, right? So by combining user and limit and proc, by, for example, setting limit and proc to one, you basically say, this service um, will run as that user. And because you say that this user can at most have exactly one process, you basically disable forking. It's kind of the same thing that I showed earlier, where you actually disable the forking via the, the, the system call filtering. But this one does it via um, uh, uh, process limits. Here's another one, root directory. Root directory is, uh, is uh, a little bit like the classic true root. I'm pretty sure most of you who at least have been around longer on Unix know true root. It's like this thing, it's a little bit like containers, except not. Um, it basically allows um, you to, to run something under a different uh, root directory so that it gets a different view on the operating system. Uh, using this is, uh, requires preparation, right? You need to actually have this uh, directory tree around. Um, but yeah, it's there. Um, if you want to make use of it, you probably need to know Unix quite a bit. Here's another one. I already talked about resource limits, right? Resource li limit, like R limit no file. Um, there's another one which is pretty useful, which is actually R limit F size. R limit F size puts a resource limit, like a limit, on the file sizes that a specific um, uh, service can uh, uh, create. Now, I think for most cases, that's a pretty useless setting, right? Because you can set it to, I don't know, 100 megabytes, and it basically means that that service cannot create any files that are larger than 100 megabytes, which I don't think is particularly useful. But what it is useful for is that you can actually um, turn off the creation of any kind of file for that service. Simply by setting limit F size to E0, um, you basically tell the kernel, yeah, this um, thing can open anything it likes, um, but nothing, it cannot create any new file. It's kind of a very simple, very um, brutal way to turn off any kind of file creation for a service. Here's another one, device allow, right? We talked about private devices already. You know, pri private devices was this thing where you can run a service and can give it a private minimal version of slash dev, right? Um, where it only gets access to dev null, dev zero, and so, uh, uh, things like that. Often, um, that's kind of useful. But in other cases, you kind of want to allow like, you just want to define a policy that is more than this black and white thing where you say, yeah, no physical uh, access but virtual access. With device allow, you can define policies where you can say, yeah, it gets access to these kinds of devices but nothing else. The way this looks, here's an example. You can say, wow, I made another typo there. Ignore that. Where's my laser pointer? Uh, there you go. This M is not supposed to be there. It basically just um, uh, says device allow equals uh, def SDA5. And that means, yeah, this thing gets access to no devices except slash def SDA5. And it may read, write, or create a device node for it. Here's another example um, by saying device allow, uh, device allow char um, dash alsa. It basically, you define a policy that says no device access to anything except for character devices of the kernel subsystem type ELSA, which this is basically a policy that says this uh, service may access only audio sound cards. Probably not useful as a policy for you guys because servers don't have audio, but you get the idea, right? Like, you can say uh, device allow, uh, allow equals um, char whatever kernel subsystem you have, and then it gets access to that and nothing else. So this is one of the, of the last one, the things I have is actually um, a relatively recent addition which is tasks max. One question, question about the device allow. Uh, can you combine the uh, private and allow so you can say, keep it mostly private, but include a couple of things? Um, actually, you can't right now, but it's a good idea that we should do that. 
True. Okay. But yeah, 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 we should probably, um, like, if you combine it, then we should, uh, like, what's currently missing is the fact that if you declare something here and you have private devices on, then you actually do get access to the device nodes, but the device node won't exist, right? Uh, but it, it should be, actually, it's a really good idea. We should fix that hole and just say, if you define this and list the device node there, then it should also exist in slash dev for that. Very good idea, actually. Um, any further questions at this point? Okay, then uh, let's go to task max. So um, on Linux, um, like if you have been around on Linux, then uh, you probably know the concept of a fork bomb, right? The fork bomb is a thing where inside of a for loop, you invoke the fork system call. And uh, that basically has the effect that uh, you create um, processes in exponent, like an exponential um, amount of processes in a very short time, right? Like because every child will fork again to become two children which will fork again. So um, fork bombs have always been a very efficient way to bring any Linux system to a standstill. And it's kind of sad that it was that way. So very recently, it just took us uh, like uh, 25 years since Linux was incepted <laughs> and the problem of fork bombs was created, uh, we got, got this concept of task max. It basically allows you to say, this service may have this number of processes at any time, regardless which user um, um, regardless whatever else, um, how it created it, if it created it uh, by invoking a shell script, and if that shell script invokes a Hadoop binaries, it doesn't matter. This service only gets this many processes and not any more. If they try to create more processes, it will fail with permission denied. Um, we actually turned this one on for all system services recently by default which is actually quite a change because some software, like, like database software, doesn't actually like that so much. But we figured um, finally being able to close this vulnerability to fork bombing um, is something that it's worth um, having to deal for a short, short time with the fact that the, the services actually need more than the default of 512 um, services um, uh, yeah, to, ch to fix those. So yeah, it's the end of fork bombs effectively, at least from exploited services. Of course, um, task max doesn't really apply to logged in users, but I figure at this conference, most people are not too concerned about locally logged in users anyway. One more. Uh, does that include threads, subthreads of the task? Uh, who's asking the question? But Back over here. Oh, there. Sorry. Yeah? Uh, does this include uh, threads? Uh, yeah, actually, ta it, it's called tasks and not processes. Uh, task is like the generic work word for yeah. processes and tasks uh, and threads. OK. Um, so that's actually the, the last um, slide I have. Um, the really last thing I have, bef uh, though, is the big announcement for a systemd.conf that we'll have later this year. But uh, before we come to that, I think we should have more questions or something, if anybody has any question. By the way, I was trying to get you to talk about systemd daemon re-exec. Oh, right. To... OK, yeah. Thanks for your kind talk. Um, you, you talked about the task max, max that when you had the default, it will it might uh, have problems with with databases and stuff like that. So my question would be, um, what is the default for all those security uh, options? Is it more secure or less secure to be compatible with other services? Okay, Thank that's you. a very good question. So, um, of course, I mean, ideally, we would have had these settings since day one that systemd was created, so that everybody who writes a service file would have to turn it off explicitly, so that we would have be secure by default. This is, of course, something we couldn't do, because we added these bit by bit as systemd progressed. And if we would turn them on, like, for example, the ability to, to, to write to slash user, then we would each time break some kind of uh, a service with that. Like, for example, if, I don't know, the, the service that updates RPMs or, or deb files, uh, uh, packages or something like that, it would suddenly not get access to slash user anymore, then we would have broken that service. And that's, of course, something we couldn't do. So most of these settings actually default to off, um, except for this one and maybe a couple of other ones. This one defaults to 512 because this one is not really binary run, right? Like it's not, you don't have it on and off. You, you just actually set a, set a value there. Um, we have turned like all of systemd's components, right? Like the journal and, and all the mini demons that we have. Um, they have this all enabled, um, like as far as that makes sense to it, right? Like login D, uh, journal D, um, whatever else there is. Um, it's all locked down and living in its little uh, sandbox. So if you manage to exploit any of the system tools, um, you are running with minimal privileges, and that's the way it should be. Uh, one quick question. 
For any of these options, uh, what is the default behavior of the kernel? Is it going to core dump the service? Uh, is it possible to define a policy, maybe to restart the service, log uh, the offending operation, and so on and so forth? Um, that's a very good question. So the, that really depends on the, on the security feature here. Um, something like tasks max um, will just um, result in some specific error, like error number that's uh, returned if you try to fork something off, right? It will just say, I think, uh, I don't know the precise error, but it will do that. Most of these do by default. Like if you, you have device allow, then it will basically result in eperm. And if you have uh, yeah, a limit f size, you will actually get some other specific one. But you can for the system call stuff. And uh, like this one, this one, and this one, you can actually specify in systemd what shall happen. So you can configure the error number, and you can actually say that it shall, should abort instead of actually uh, allowing it through. Um, but the, most of the other ones will just give you access denied to the application. So everything, they, they should be able to deal with that mostly. Um, yeah. Um, the, some of these options seem like uh, kind of the sa doing the same thing like SE Linux or other frameworks. Of course, they seem much easier to use, so I would probably prefer to use them and not SE Linux. Yep. Do you actually recommend to secure the system with the systemd features and not to bother with the complexity of SE Linux? Well, you know, I'm a Red Hat engineer, so there's something that I'm supposed to say, and then, then that's my, my own opinion. Everything I say here is, of course, my own opinion, and I think SE Linux is great technology, um, but of course, it's, I don't understand it. Um, so, uh, yeah, these settings are, to some level, redundant by SE Linux, so if you can express the same policies in SE Linux, but only to a certain level. Many of these, like private TMP, TMP for example, is something you cannot express with SE Linux. So my recommendation is also there's this little problem that SE Linux is kind of Fedora Red Hat specific, uh, CentOS specific, and most other distributions do not use it by default. Um, but most distributions do use systemd by default. So my encouragement is always, if you use this option, then um, your service will run in a protected sandbox on all Linux distributions by default out of the box. So my recommendation is, yeah, these are really supposed to be easy. Like in most of the cases, they are just booleans that I think most people will easily understand. And that's why we created them, and that's why I think they are probably more interesting for most people than SLinux Linux policy is, because um, there are probably in this world 50 people who can write SLinux Linux policy, but I really hope that there are more than 50 people who can write these uh, settings into their unit files. Um, I actually agree with that assessment, and I'm very happy that you spend all the time innovating the core systems of Linux. Thank you. And I think you shouldn't listen to the other people who... Yeah, don't I don't so. do that anymore anyway, but yeah. Um, Anyway, let's, uh, if there are uh, no further questions, then, then let's, if somebody has one, let's do that um, um, uh, uh, later um, in the hallways. Let's talk about the last thing that I have on my slides, which is systemd.conf 2016. Um, so we had one, uh, the first systemd conference last year in Berlin, um, and we'll have one this time again. Last year, we mostly focused it on uh, developers and uh, uh, um, like professional um, DevOps people. This time, we'll actually extend it and actually do hands-on workshop sessions, so kind of a training thing um, for one day more. So uh, um, if you are interested in systemd and uh, service management and all, everything that's related to systemd, like systemd and spawn, then please feel invited. Um, uh, we're still looking for sponsors. We have a couple of sponsors that I'm supposed to announce here, so let me quickly do that. Um, the uh, sponsors um, who already agreed to sponsor the conference are thankfully CoreOS, uh, Calabra, Kinfolk, Pantheon, Pangotronics, and uh, my own employer, Red Hat. Um, and we hopefully will get even more than, than these. Um, yeah, last year's conference was a great success, I think. I like to believe. Um, so we hope that this time it will be as good um, again. Uh, yeah, go to that website uh, if you want to know more about that. Um, also, um, Chris, where's Chris? I don't see Chris. Um, somewhere there. He's going to open at this moment or something the CFP for system.conf. So uh, if you uh, would like to talk about something, or if you would like to do a training session on the first day, please submit something under that URL uh, now or later. Like, it's going to be open for two months or something. So um, 
Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, um, if you have any further questions, let's uh, talk outside or something like that. And see you all, of course, in Berlin again at systemd.conf. Thank you. <laughs>